Good afternoon to everyone and welcome to our uh, CECOM webinar for University of Sydney. My name is Kamran Pajapur. For people who don't know us, I work for, as Microscopy Product Manager for AXT. We represent a large number of scientific instrument manufacturers in Australia and New Zealand, of which Del Delmec um, is one of them. We have been working with Delmec for um, almost two, two and a half years now. Um, they are a company based in Netherlands, um, working on two um, very unique platforms, combining light and electron microscopes. The instrument that um, we are going to talk about today is called SECOM. SECOM is the only true in situ and live a correlative microscopy platform in the world right now, which combines fluorescence microscope with a scanning electron microscope. Uh, this in instrument has been um, uh, developed from scratch by Delmec and uh, has been promoted and has been sold to many, many universities uh, around the world. And we hope actually to bring the first one in Australia very soon as well. Um, so before you get sick of hearing about um, this, uh, I'll actually um, introduce our speaker today, who is Dr. Sangeeta Hari. Uh, she has been working with Delmec for uh, almost a year now as an uh, application specialist for SECOM platform. Um, she uh, achieved her uh, Bachelor of Science in 2005 and then a master's degree in 2007 in India, and then worked in research uh, in atomic and molecular physics um, at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai, till uh, 2011, and then moved to Netherlands to do her PhD at the Delft University. And after finishing her PhD, which was um, uh, about generating sub 30 nanometer lithography um, patterns uh, by a scanning electron microscopes, joined Delmec to um, start looking after the SECOM platform. Um, so I'm sure that you will enjoy this talk today. And now I leave it with Sangeeta to start the talk and do the presentation. Thanks all, and thanks to you, Sangeeta, over to you. Thank you. So hello everyone, and welcome to this webinar on integrated correlative microscopy on the SECOM. As Kamran said, SECOM is a platform manufactured by Delmic. So let me start by telling you a little bit about the company, about us. Delmic was founded in 2010. It's a spin-off company of the Technical University of Delft and the Amhof Institute in Amsterdam, both in the Netherlands. And it was started by two professors, Peter Kraut at the TU Delft and Albert Pohlmann at the Amhof Institute. And we manufacture integrated products for cathodoluminescence and correlative microscopy. So let me begin by giving an introduction to, to correlative microscopy. What is this technique? And uh, let me just pause here to point out that at any time in this presentation, if you have questions about the, the fundamentals of the technique or about the instrumentation or any question relevant to this subject, feel free to, to type it in in the, in the Q&A section. And uh, we will pause a couple of times to, to try and answer these questions in between. And you can also send them to us by email. So what is correlative microscopy? It's a combination of two techniques. The first of which is fluorescence microscopy. So fluorescence is a phenomenon where an atom or a molecule in the ground state can absorb uh, a photon and go to an excited state. Uh, that's shown in orange. And from there, it can decay to a, a lower singlet excited state shown in red. And the energy difference can be given out as photons. And this phenomenon is called fluorescence. So how is this used as a microscopy technique? So it's very popular, especially in biology, because if you have a cell or a part of a cell or part of an organelle, it's possible to uh, attach antibodies either to genetically modify the cell itself to express fluorescence or to attach antibodies to different parts of the cell. And if these antibodies are then attached to fluorescent molecules, it's possible to image the fluorescence and therefore image the cell in a microscope. This is broadly speaking the concept of fluorescence microscopy. 
And what it results in is specific labeling, because these antibodies can be targeted to certain parts of the cell alone. And what this gives us is functional information. As I said, the antibodies would target specific functions or specific parts of the cell. And the resolution is limited by the, the diffraction limit. So for light, it's of the order of 200 nanometers. This is in brief how fluorescence microscopy, standard fluorescence microscopy is used. The other technique that correlative microscopy utilizes is electron microscopy. This is a technique where an electron beam, shown in this image as primary electrons, when that is incident on a sample, the surface of the sample is shown in, in pale orange. The energy of the electrons, if it's of the order of thousands of electron volts, the electrons penetrate into the sample to some depth. And all along the way, they interact with the, the molecules present in the sample or the crystal structure of the sample. And this gives rise to a host of scattering events. And those are shown in, in pink. So there are different kinds of uh, events possible resulting in uh, electrons of different ranges of energies. So it's possible to have very low energy electrons, less than 50 EV, which are generated by inelastic scattering events. Those are called the secondary electrons. It's possible to have higher energy backscattered electrons, which are elastic or close to elastic low loss scattering events. That's also shown on the right as backscattered electrons. It's also possible to, to lose electrons because they're absorbed by the material or because they don't have the energy to, to exit the sample. And if this sample turns out to be very thin, it's also possible that the, some of the electrons penetrate and come out the other end. So how is this used as a microscopy technique? When this takes place inside a scanning electron microscope, for example, it's possible to have a sample that's labeled somehow with heavy metals. So I am speaking now about non-specific labeling. This does not target function, but it's just labeling with heavy metals that go and stick, for example, to all the fats in a biological sample or all the lipids or anything with a membrane. And what you see here is actually an electron microscope image of a biological sample. And the contrast that's visible is because of the staining with heavy metals. So what electron microscopy gives us is structural information. And this is complementary to what we get from fluorescence microscopy, which was, as we saw, functional information. And one of the biggest advantages of electron microscopy is that it gives a very high resolution. A scanning electron microscope can give easily a resolution of five nanometers, often better. And transmission electron microscopy can give about sub-nanometer resolution. So correlative microscopy is a technique that combines these two. It combines the power of fluorescence microscopy and electron microscopy. So what are the advantages of correlative microscopy? As we saw, we get both functional and structural information. And what this does is that it overcomes one of the, the biggest limitations of fluorescence microscopy, which is, although it's commonly used in biology, the disadvantage of fluorescence microscopy is that you only image Inherently, you only image what you want to image. So because the tagging is, is functional, the antibodies only tag to, to what you know they are going to tag to, because they are designed only to tag certain parts of the cell. You only image what you have decided to image. And electron microscopy, on the other hand, allows you to image everything that is there. Another advantage of correlative microscopy is that you can have long-range multicolor labeling. So the entire sample can be labeled for different functionalities using different antibodies and different fluorophores attached. So you can detect fluorescence in different colors. It also helps in identifying the cells without any bias because you have functional information from the fluorescence image Electron microscopy alone has this disadvantage because you are restricted to identifying cells based on their structure alone. 
So by manually looking at a cell, you would be uh, forced to decide whether this is the cell of interest or not. Whereas now in correlative microscopy, you have fluorescence, which gives us functional information. So you can see, for example, that you, uh, if a cell is, is appearing green or, or orange, you know what kind of cell it is because a certain kind of antibody would have tagged it. And another interesting and useful application is that it permits liquid cell imaging, which is important for studying samples uh, in their near native state or live cell imaging. So here's an example of, of a fluorescence image. And here is a simultaneously acquired electron image. And the overlay shows you in, in one picture the power of electron microscopy. So there is structural information of this cellular unit as well as functional information. So you see that you have green fluorescence only from certain parts of the cell, it's not everywhere. And, and a biologist can interpret this data then to see which part of the cell has what function or what disease or what condition. So as I said, the, the image on the left with the, the green fluorescence shows you the power of this technique. And the image on the right shows you one of the other big advantages, which is multicolor labeling. So in blue and orange, you can see different parts of the cell clearly perform different functions and have a different composition. And this is visible in the context of the ultrastructure of the cell. So the grayscale, the black and white, comes about due to electron contrast. So this is in brief correlative microscopy and how it can be used as a powerful technique for imaging in biology, for example. So I'll pause briefly at this point to see if there are any questions. Uh, as I said, feel free to type them in at uh, any point during this presentation and uh, we'll come back to it. Okay, so if there are none at this moment, Let me describe how this is performed. So we know the concept of correlative microscopy, and this is done in a simultaneous way. So the electron imaging and the fluorescence imaging is performed simultaneously in what is called the CECOM platform. It's an optical system which results in an integrated scanning electron microscope and fluorescence microscope that permits simultaneous correlative imaging. So the picture on the left shows you what an integrated microscope looks like. So it's a regular scanning electron microscope and the, the door in blue, which says Delmic at the bottom, that is the optical part. As you can see, it's neatly integrated into an existing electron microscope. So let's take a look at what it looks like on the inside. This is on the right. The schematic shows you what the setup is. Here in the little disc in orange is the sample. So first the fluorescence part, the, the light source sends in light of certain wavelength, which is then guided towards the sample. It excites the fluorescence in the sample and the light that is the fluorescent light that is then emitted from the sample is transported back. Uh, and the dichroic here allows us to use the same path for the emission and the excitation. And this light is then collected by a camera. So that's how the fluorescence imaging works in this system. Now, simultaneously with that, in green here, you can see how the electron beam is made incident on the same sample. This is performed inside the, the scanning electron microscope. So this part and the sample are in vacuum. And after the electrons are incident on the sample, they interact with the sample, like I described before, generating a host of electron scattering events. And there is a secondary electron detector present here to detect the secondary electrons, the low energy electrons that come out from the sample. It's also possible to have a backscattered electron detector and various other types of detectors. They all give different kinds of information. However, the electron imaging in general gives structural information about the sample. So in this setup, uh, we perform simultaneous light and electron imaging. 
So a little bit in detail about the CCOM platform itself, you can see a user operating it. So on, the, on his left screen is a fluorescence image and on the right, an electron image. So what are the advantages of such a system? It's an integrated system, which means that the workflow for CLEM, which is correlative light and electron microscopy, the workflow is streamlined. So since it's a simultaneous uh, acquisition, there is no need to transport the sample between a fluorescence microscope and an electron microscope. Now, this may sound like a straightforward thing. And what is important to realize here is that this is one of the biggest sources of contamination in microscopy. The fact that there is no need now to uh, stain a sample, prepare a sample for fluorescence microscopy, image it in a fluorescence microscope in one building, for example, and then take it out, prepare it differently for electron microscopy, and go with it to a different building and image it in an electron microscope. This is a huge advantage for imaging because it avoids sample contamination, it avoids sample loss, damage, breakage, dropping. Another important thing to keep in mind is that this system is, is very compact and in vacuum. However, you can still use high NA fluorescence, and I will explain uh, this in a bit. And the overlay procedure, which is one of the, the main sources of concern in correlative microscopy, because you use two different microscopes are used to acquire the fluorescence image and the electron image. So how, how well can the two images be overlaid? Or in other words, how confident can you be that you are imaging the, the same particles or the same region in both microscopes. So the, the CLEM, the integrated CLEM, has an automated overlay procedure. And as you see, this system, the CCOM platform, can be retrofitted onto an existing scanning electron microscope. So it's not a standalone system. And there is an open source software that allows you to easily take advantage of these benefits. So I'll go into to each of these features in, in detail in a little bit. But first, let's take a look inside the system. So what does the CCOM platform look like on the inside? The large image on the left uh, is the part which is in vacuum. So there is the, the annular metal disc on which there is a sample placed on cover glass. So that's the, the sample with the, the section or the biological sample of interest. And what you see in the center, just sticking out, is actually the, the objective lens. The sample holder is mounted on the sample stage, which is this large metal piece, capable of, of moving in, in X and Y. And there is an X, Y, Z stage for moving the objective. So it can move laterally as well as in Z. And the image on the, on the top right, that shows the immersion oil objective. So that's the objective lens and the sample above it. And this is a droplet of a vacuum compatible immersion oil that uh, allows the acquisition of a high resolution optical image. And below you can see how it is that the system can be retrofitted and is compatible with the FEI, Zeiss, Scan Hitachi as well as JL microscopes. So this is what the, the system looks like when the door has slid out of it. So it's open so you can see here is the pole piece of the electron microscope and here is the sample holder and stage which I showed on the left. So let's come to straight away to the, the most important aspect or the issue of, of great concern in correlative microscopy and that's the overlay procedure. So as I mentioned, here we have an automated overlay. And how does that work? So very briefly, it works on the principle of cathodoluminescence. So when the camera of the fluorescence microscope is, is open, the electron beam can be seen because the electron beam impinges on the glass, which is of the sample, and the cathodoluminescence generated there by the electron beam can be detected by the camera, the same way that the camera detects fluorescence. So using this feature, we can write a grid of many spots. 
And you can imagine each of these spots to then be a temporary fiducial marker. So we don't need to have physical markers on the sample prepared by any complicated lithography procedure. It's a, it's a marker that's created by the electron beam itself in the system on the sample, on a, on a region that is not of interest. And these markers are used to correlate the electron image and the fluorescence image. So what does it result in? The correlation is now independent of the sample because it's performed on every sample that you put in as and when you need it. It's fully automatic. The writing and detection of this grid, as well as the overlay that results, is automatic. And it's very precise. So this method can correct for rotation between images, scaling, including nonlinear scaling, as well as position, lateral position, between the two kinds of images. So the whole goal of having such a streamlined workflow and an automated overlay is that it should be easy to acquire correlative images. Towards that, let me describe the, the workflow and you can see how straightforward it becomes in an integrated system. So the first step, when you put in your sample and pump down the system, so you should remember at this point that this part is the bit in vacuum and the rest is, is outside vacuum. So the sample is pumped down to high vacuum. And then using the, the light from the source, you excite fluorescence in the sample and you get an image of a, of a biological sample, which looks something like this. As you can see, this is a two color image. There are two fluorophores attached. The next step is to have the electron image. So the electron beam is made incident on the sample and an image of the same region is acquired. So keep in mind, there has been no movement of the sample in between. So the position is retained and that results in a, in a much higher resolution image, of course, as is expected from an electron image. So now we have a fluorescence image and a simultaneously acquired electron image. What needs to be done is the alignment or the overlay. And that is performed by making a grid with the electron beam and detecting the cathode luminescence, as I just described. So this is, in brief, the workflow for simultaneous correlative imaging. And as I said, this whole procedure needs to be very easy to use for which the software is key. This is what the, the graphical user interface looks like. So it's an open source software and it can control both the, the sample movement as well as the electron microscope and the fluorescence microscope. So using this, you can navigate across the sample to, to different regions of interest and acquire images there using both microscopes. This open source software called Odemis can be used via this user-friendly graphical user interface, or alternatively, if you have a customized script that is also fully supported. So you can write your own script for, for defining your own workflow and imaging in a certain way that is suitable for your experiment. Let me describe briefly the features of this system. So the software features include an automated alignment procedure, you can have a, a live imaging, so that's typically with a fast scan, so you can navigate across the sample and determine the regions of interest. And once you are there at the, the region of interest, you can also uh, acquire a higher resolution image there with a higher dwell time, for example. That's with this feature. You can have multiple color channels. For example, if your sample is tagged with different fluorophores, by adding what is called streams. So this is one stream, which is uh, exciting a certain wavelength and detecting the corresponding wavelength. You can add multiple streams of this kind. And you can directly visualize the overlay. So this quadrant here, the bottom right quadrant, shows a large field of view fluorescence image with the fluorescence in red. And in the center, is a high magnification scanning electron microscope image. And using the slider at the bottom of the screen, it's possible to have different mixing of the two signals. So a biologist can go through this slider 
and take a look at uh, this, what is happening in that region in the context of the structure of that region. And this supports uh, OME TIFF and HDF5 file formats, which are very useful for handling large data sets. So that's in brief how the software and control works for the CECOM. So with this, with the concept of correlative microscopy and a bit about the instrumentation, how the technique works, let's uh, look at the applications that this is widely used for and also some applications that, that we are now beginning to, to use it for. So the first application that I'm going to discuss is in the field of neuroscience. So we know that electron microscopy is capable of high resolution imaging of synaptic connections in the brain. So what is the disadvantage then with electron microscopy? Why is it not good enough for this? Is that you need a long imaging time per pixel. So electron microscopy works by scanning the beam across the sample. And in order to have a high signal to noise ratio, it's necessary to have a high dwell time per pixel. So what this results in is a very long imaging time if you want to image a large area of several microns by microns. On the other hand, fluorescence microscopy is capable of large scale imaging because it's a one shot, one exposure imaging technique. So if you label uh, the sample with fluorescent tracers, which attach to neurons, you can directly image brain connectivity. But the disadvantage there is that the resolution is nowhere near good enough because it's uh, diffraction limited. You remember it's about 200 nanometers. So correlative imaging offers a large field of view fluorescence microscope and high magnification, high resolution scanning electron microscopy. So this is a, an example of an image acquired using the CECOM platform, where you can see the neural connections in a songbird brain. So the green fluorescence shows the, the functional information. And it's in the context of the ultrastructure of the cell. That's the grayscale contrast that's visible here. So that brings me to, to one of the, the main concerns in this technique, which is sample preparation. Because fluorescence microscopy and electron microscopy are not, the sample preparation techniques are not obviously compatible with each other. There are two main concerns roughly in such a case. The first is that scanning electron microscopy requires the sample to be dry. But very often, in order to observe fluorescence, an aqueous environment is needed. So there needs to be water in the system. This is the first challenge when we think of combining these two techniques. The other challenge is the heavy metal staining that is needed to generate this contrast in the electron image that is known to quench the fluorescence. So because the fluorescence is generated by fluorophores, which are uh, molecules which can be excited and generate fluorescence, very often when these molecules are placed in proximity to a heavy metal atom, it results in, in the molecule no longer being able to fluoresce. And this is called quenching. So these are the two concerns in sample preparation, which are challenging and very valid concerns. However, this image illustrates that it is possible to have a sample preparation protocol, which allows you to, to preserve the fluorescence while observing electron contrast. So there was an uh, on-section immunolabeling protocol that was implemented for this particular sample. And you can see uh, what a correlative image looks like, having both functional and structural information. The second application that I'm going to describe now is in the study of type 1 diabetes. So it's an autoimmune disease where the beta cells, which are present in the body, in, in the pancreas, in a region called the islet of Langerhans, these beta cells are responsible for detecting the, the sugar level in the blood. So immediately after you have a meal, for example, if the sugar level is elevated, the beta cells signal that this sugar needs to be uptaken and converted to glucose. So in type 1 diabetes, these beta cells are attacked and destroyed by the body itself. 
and they are no longer able to perform this function. So what this results in is elevated blood sugar levels because they are not taken up by the cell and they remain in the blood for prolonged periods. So this results in, in multiple organ failure because of prolonged blood sugar levels being high. And it results in cell death because they can no longer convert this to energy. The mechanism for type 1 diabetes is unknown. So if we use fluorescence microscopy to image what is taking place in the body in this condition, you can get functional information as this image shows. So different parts in the islets are in the pancreas are visible in different colors. So they perform different functions. Since this is not good enough resolution, electron microscopy is often used to study this. And you can see a very high resolution image. But the disadvantage is that this is labor intensive. So in order to, to diagnose a disease, it's not sufficient to take a, a high resolution image at one location. Typically, uh, medical professionals, doctors, or biologists studying this would like to have a, an image over a large area in order to be confident of what is taking place. And electron microscopy then becomes extremely labor intensive. And there is also an error a high degree of error possible in identifying the cells because if you have only electron microscopy, you have only this image, and the cells need to be identified based on their morphology alone, so based on the contrast or the shape. And this is done typically by, by having manual annotation, so people sitting in front of a screen and going over the image, a large image, and manually identifying the cells of interest. So as you can imagine, this is very error prone. So correlative imaging can offer functional information, or beta cell in this case, in the context of cellular ultrastructure. So this is a correlative image. And you can see the functional information. So the beta cells are uh, shown in orange, because that's the tagging to the insulin. In green, you can see the, the guanin quadruplex. And in blue, you can see the, the nucleus. And all of this can be seen in the context of the ultrastructure. That's the advantage of correlative imaging for type 1 diabetes. And the sample preparation here, just for your information, is, is this is performed with 80 nanometer thick sections of healthy rat pancreas, so very thin sections, but with an ultramicrotome. It's fixed with osmium tetroxide. It's dehydrated, embedded in resin, and then immunolabeled, which is labeling for fluorescence contrast. And in this case, there is no heavy metal staining, but the electron contrast comes about because of the osmium tetroxide, so essentially from the osmium. So I'll take a, a little break at this point and check for, for questions. Um, one of the questions is about sample preparation. So is it in resin fluorescence and how the sample is mounted? So as I said, in these two examples, the sample preparation techniques differ. So that depends on, uh, on what you want to look at. Um, so the sample is mounted. Yes, that's an important question. So since we have uh, fluorescence imaging as one of the techniques, it's necessary for the sample to be transparent because the, the light is uh, collected at the bottom. Simultaneously with that, for the electron imaging, it's necessary that the, what the electron beam sees is, is a conducting surface. So it's not possible to image glass in a scanning electron microscope. So typically what is used for such imaging is a, a glass cover slip coated with a thin layer of indium tin oxide, ITO is conducting and transparent. So it's uh, schematically speaking, it's the lowest part of the sample, which is on the sample stage, is glass. On top of that is the layer of indium tin oxide. And above that is the section or the cell or the sample of interest. So that's how it can be imaged simultaneously. Um, there's a question about the uh, immersion oil. So. The question is whether the, the sample or the oil immersion are exposed to the SEM vacuum. 
So the answer is yes, the sample is in vacuum and uh, the immersion oil that is used is vacuum compatible. So yes, that's, that's also in vacuum. And that is known to, to work perfectly well. Uh, there is another question, is super resolution fluorescence microscopy possible or available? Um, so the answer is yes. Uh, I will describe this in some more detail in a few slides. It is possible to have a super resolution fluorescence microscopy of, of a certain kind. There is a system available and we can, uh, if you're interested in a certain kind of super resolution, we can, we can have a discussion about it. So, And those are all the questions for the moment. So continuing with the applications, that brings me to one of the, the applications that we are currently working on, which is to use correlative imaging in medical diagnostics, particularly in pathology. So the current workflow in pathology in, in hospitals is to image a sample in a fluorescence microscope in air. And if there is something of interest or something suspicious, which indicates the presence of a disease, the sample can then be prepared for electron microscopy and sent to a TEM specialist to be imaged. The disadvantage is that TEM imaging is expensive, is also time consuming. It requires experienced users and it's not performed simultaneously with the fluorescence imaging. So what the, it results in a, in a challenge, which is to locate the high resolution features of particles in the fluorescence microscope, because the, the presence of a disease or the absence of a disease is, is often indicated by uh, small particles. And it's not possible to discuss these, uh, to image these in the, in the fluorescence microscope. And so they need to be imaged in the TEM. But since this imaging is not simultaneous, there is always some, or there can be some doubt about what is actually taking place in the sample. So here I would like to describe the Delphi, which is a tabletop system for correlative imaging. This is what the system looks like. So on the right, you can see a computer screen with the, the graphical user interface displayed. And on the left is the entire correlative imaging system. So that's a scanning electron microscope integrated with the SECOM platform. And it's available as a standalone system called the Delphi. So it's a tabletop system. And it's, it has great potential for use in diagnostics, primarily because it's fast. So it's a simultaneous fluorescence and electron imaging system which has a pump down time of five minutes. So you can rapidly put samples through it and inspect them. And it's also very easy to use. Everything is automated. And the idea is to essentially add resolution to the fluorescence images, which are commonly used in pathology, instead of having to take the sample out and prepare it differently and put it in a TEM. So the entire procedure can be carried out inside this tabletop system. So to give you an idea of what they look at in pathology, this is a fluorescence image of a human kidney section from a hospital in the Netherlands. The, the feature in the center of the screen is a glomerulus. And if you take a scanning electron image simultaneously on the Delphi of this region of interest, you can see what the, the contrast looks like. And since this is a, a healthy kidney, it is not possible to see particles or things that indicate a disease, but this image is just representative of, of what you can get on the Delphi system and how it helps in, in diagnostics because this was acquired simultaneously, which saves a lot of time. And time is one of the, the main things in medical diagnostics for hospitals. And this was acquired on the Delphi using a backscattered electron detector. So that brings me to the super resolution system, which was also one of the questions and one of the, the biggest specialized correlative imaging systems that we have. It's called the super resolution CLEM in vacuo or the SR system. 
So how does it work? The workflow is, is the following. So a sample, for example, uh, HeLa cells infected with the virus are frozen and embedded in resin, and 200 nanometer thick sections are mounted in the cleanse setup. So the image number one shows the, the fluorophore containing cells or tissues in resin, and the image number two shows what the, the sections look like and that they are mounted here on the, ito, on the sample holder on an ito cover slip. The fluorescent cells are first located, so the sample is mounted in the, in the CLEM system, and the fluorescent cells are located using the CECOM platform in the scanning electron microscope. They are first located using wide field imaging, so regular fluorescence imaging. That results in uh, typically in an image like this. And then this is a super resolution technique similar to STORM. So the, the laser power is increased, and this causes the fluorophores to, to blink. And then approximately 30,000 images are collected in one location. So there is no sample translation at this point. And this is the, the super resolution mode, which results in a, a reconstructed image like this. Following this, the electron microscope image is acquired using a backscattered electron detector. And this is the EM mode, or the electron microscopy mode, which results in a high resolution image of, at the same location, which is something like this. And then the same sequence of wide field super resolution EM, the sequence is performed over several locations in, in XY or in Z, if its uh, sections have been taken from different depths. That results in a tile of images like this. So the images acquired here, here, and here. So the wide field super resolution SEM images were acquired simultaneously, then shifted to another location in XY, and the same sequence performed, and so on. So a large tile of images is acquired. The super resolution images are reconstructed using something called thunderstorm. And here you can see an overlay of wide field with the electron microscope image and the super resolution with the electron microscope image. Again, for the entire tile, so all the locations. So if we zoom into the, to the overlay, you can see the clear improvement in resolution with the electron image as a context. You can see how much the super resolution improves, what you can see compared to the wide field image. And quantitatively speaking, a resolution of about 85 nanometers was achieved using this technique. So for more details, you can refer to this publication, which came out this year. And this was performed using a specialized standalone super resolution CLEM system with the SECOM platform. So I will present now some work that is in progress, which is very important for biology in general, where people aim to understand networks and connectivity over a large sample area. So the goal here is large area imaging, which as I just described is in all these examples is labor intensive and challenging for many reasons. So what we need for this is a completely integrated workflow. So the stage movement must be automated as well as the alignment and the stitching of the images. So in that direction, we have some preliminary results. And to show you what we are going for, what we would like to do is something like this. It's an electron image of a certain region. The stage is moved, an electron image of the neighboring region, and so on. So a tile of electron images is acquired to image a large area. This must be done in an automated way, and the image is stitched together to have a large area image in the SEM. Simultaneously with this, the fluorescence image has to be acquired, and the two need to be overlaid to result in something like this. So this is a large area correlative image where you can see multicolor labeling, functional information from this labeling in the context of the ultrastructure of the biological sample, which is visible as grayscale contrast. So all in all, the CECOM is, an integrated plat is a platform for integrated CLEM, 
Uh, it's the ultimate correlative solution because you can do correlative microscopy very fast with high optical quality and a very accurate overlay. The overlay is automatic, so you can spend your time acquiring and analyzing the data instead of aligning the two microscopes. The overlay procedure, as I said, is very accurate, and uh, it's possible to use vacuum-compatible immersion oil, so you can have high-resolution optical imaging as well. And very importantly, it's a retrofit, so it's compatible with almost all SEMs. It also has support for beam deceleration mode, because in biology, it's often important to use a low landing energy of the electrons to prevent cell damage. You can also use the uh, electron immersion mode for ultra high resolution electron imaging. And a variety of detectors can be used, like the secondary electron detector, backscattered uh, EDX, energy dispersive X-ray, as well as a in-lens secondary electron detector. So that brings me to the end of this presentation, which was uh, brought to you in collaboration with AXT, a distributor in Australia. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions, and you can also email them to us at a later stage. So I will look at the questions now. There seem to be um, there are some questions about uh, sample preparation. So how to image GFP transfected cells in brain tissue, whether the brain tissue needs to be resin embedded and sectioned. So these are, these are details that, uh, that we can discuss or we can look up publications for, but yeah, sample preparation is, is key for correlative imaging. I don't know the exact details of how GFP transfected cells in brain tissue can be imaged. Um, Yes, yeah, so there is a question about storm. So a special imaging buffer is needed for storm. Uh, and the question is, do we need a special buffer for your CLEM system? So I'm assuming this is about the, the super resolution system. And uh, in brief, the answer is no, we don't need a special buffer. And to, to see why that is or how that works, that's because there is a way by which uh, in resin fluorescence and blinking can be preserved for GFP. And uh, you can look up the, uh, the publication, which describes how this is done. If you, if you missed it, you can send me an email, and I will send you the, the reference for the publication. Uh, what is the NA of the objective used for fluorescence imaging, and what filters are available for fluorescence? So on the CCOM platform in general, you can change objectives. So you can have a 20x, 40x, 60x oil water, air objectives, they are all possible. It depends only on, uh, on your requirement. Uh, the Nikon objectives are, are used on the system. Uh, what filters are available for fluorescence? So it's a, it's, it's a set of filters. So I can send you the, the details of the wavelengths if you need, and we can discuss it if you have some uh, specific requirements that require customization of the filters as well. Those are the, the questions that I do for now. There is one more. Is the order of the sample preparation? Yes, that's, that's again a, a detail to be um, decided by the biologist and, and what they are looking at. But if there are challenges in sample preparation specific to correlative microscopy, uh, we can discuss them. So please send an email and we can look at your problem together. So thank you for your questions, and I would like to thank you for attending this webinar. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Sangeeta. It was great. Um, and thanks, everyone, for attending this webinar, and thank you very much for all the questions. Um, just to add a point to what Sangeeta said about the optics of the instrument, it's a very modular design, so in general, you can almost um, have a tailored system for your needs. So everything in that system can be completely um, customized, uh, including lens, filters, and the rest of the optics. And that's one of the beauties actually of the platforms done by Delmec in general. Their uh, cathode luminescence system is the same. 
So it's fully customizable and modular. Um, so um, I hope you enjoyed the webinar and the presentation. As Sangeeta mentioned, if you had any question, please email us. If you email them to AXT, we will forward them to Sangeeta and then you will definitely get your answer or you can um, directly email it to Delmec and definitely they get um, back to you very quickly. So I should actually thank um, specifically VJ for helping us organizing this event. Uh, without his help, definitely it couldn't be as good as it was. Thank you VJ very much. Um, to let you know, we are going to have a few more webinars um, soon. So uh, the next coming actually would be on the 17th of August. It's um, uh, regarding thermal scanning probe lithography. Maybe not relevant to all of you, but if whoever is in interested in lithography, that could be interesting. Um, second would be August 29th. That would be on the cathode luminescence applications um, for geology. And then September 29th, we will have uh, a super resolution CCOM webinar. So that uh, presentation will be specifically on the super resolution. So you can get a lot of uh, your questions answered, I think, in that webinar in more details. So I thank you all again for attending the webinar and uh, wish you all the best. Bye.